New York City is an ugly city, a dirty city. Its climate is a scandal. Its politics are used to frighten children. Its traffic is madness. Its competition is murderous. But there is one thing about it. Once you have lived in New York and it has become your home, no place else is good enough. John Steinbeck. New York! The white prisons, the sidewalks swarming with maggots, the bread lines, the opium joints that are built like palaces, the lepers, the thugs, and above all, the ennui, the monotony of faces, streets, legs, houses, skyscrapers, bums, meals, posters, jobs, crimes, loves. A whole city erected over a hollow pit of nothingness, meaningless, absolute meaningless. Henry Miller. And into this meaningless strides... Jimmy the Vinyl Man, a.k.a. Jim Giorgio, a.k.a. Jimmy Vinyl. I'm not, I'm not out here for my friggin' health, okay? I'm out here to try to live. So, $20 for the record, I gave you a deal, I normally get 30 Okay, we're in the ring, it's $20. If not, it goes out. Oh, right there. Machine right there. Okay. Oh, shit, right there. okay. Greetings, everybody. Uh, Kenny's invited me back again to talk about some jazz records, and um, I think the intention today is to to talk about records that are not so common uh, for musicians who are not uh, as well known, uh, at least stateside, uh, as they might be maybe other parts of the world. Uh, today, I'm starting with uh, Hideo Shiraki. Uh, Hideo was uh, was the king drummer. Uh, of Japan came up uh, in the 50s really to prominence and made uh, a host of records. Some of them are really great actually and he was he was really inspired by Max Roach and really Joe Jones, uh, the whole you know lineage of great jazz drummers. Uh, he's his own man. He was a conservatory trained guy who played uh, uh, came out played in classical orchestras as well but you know wanted to be a swinger. So, of course, he has a double bass drum, like Louis Belson. He's got, you know, a certain uh, militaristic side, similar to Max Roach. He's got a certain swagger, like Philly Joe, a certain thunder, like Philly Joe, as well. But this record here, I, I believe, is his first record. Um, this is not an original copy of this record. I should clarify this up front. Uh, this is record is almost impossible to find. Uh, the original of this would probably go for at least a couple thousand bucks. I have 75 on this. Uh, it's a very limited late 60s, early 70s reissue from Japan. Uh, again, not a lot of circulation on this record. And it's, um, he comes, this record comes out of like the post bop period. Very much enthralled to Horace Silver. When Horace would play Japan, these guys would hang out. I'm sure they jammed together. Uh, Horace uh, had a, a, an affection for Hideo Shiraki. It was a mutual thing. Uh, in terms of their their respect for each other, um, but this record here has some interesting tracks on it. You know, there's Tuxedo Junction on this record. There's a, uh, but you know, the drum boogie, the uh, the more attacks, the uh, night in Tunisia. There's there's a couple of tracks that are really beautifully done. Uh, the Japanese take on American post bop from the late 1950s. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're back with Boulou. Boulou Ferre is a legendary uh, Gitane uh, Manouche uh, gypsy guitarist and purportedly third, second or third nephew to Django Reinhardt, which I would totally believe because uh, when I first came in contact with him, I had found a picture sleeve 45 of him as a six-year-old. 
And it's a, it was a beautiful black and white picture sleeve cover of this little boy in a flannel shirt with this huge hollow body guitar. You know, it was a Gibson guitar, but of course he's such a little boy and this guitar is so big and it's a hollow body and it's a jazz guitar. It was, it was a, such a compelling looking cover. Of course, I brought the record home, I put it on, and I was blown away with the, not only the facility of this person and the ideas and the, the fervor, the electricity coming out of him, but the joy. He was scatting, he did salt peanuts on one of them, and, it, and, he was, and he was scatting with his own guitar lines. They were beautiful. And so everything by Bulu from that point forward, I, anything Gypsy, I've tried to make the connection with Django and with all the families, the dynasty, the Gypsy dynasties overseas. And this record probably didn't sell anything. I've never so seen it. You know, you know, maybe, you know, this is the only copy of this record I've ever seen, but this is 1974. This is the disparate uh, threads coming together between, you know, the Manouche life, the jazz life, the proto-fusion Jean McLaughlin Mahavishnu life. It's all right here. So, I mean, there are points where it's, he's got the, the heaviness of Mahavishnu. He's got, you know, a Baroque harpsichord. He's got, you know, reeds at certain points. He's got a big, he's got an orchestra at points, but it all plays into his worldview. He's a romantic. So yes, he's shredding at points. He's got an overdriven sound at points. He's, um, and at other times he's got a beautiful hollow body tone with just a little bit of overdrive on it. Uh, I love this record. At the end of the record, he does kind of a Serge Gainsbourg thing. He's kind of he's kind of doing like that that purry, kind of sexy thing where he's singing, you know, like you know, like a bed bedroom kind of thing with, um, um, you know, with like a cocktail rhythm. You know, <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> The key with these records is that you have three equals on the record. You have Jimmy Jeffrey, who is really a, ends up being a radical um, prior to the, the releases that where he just started to, to open up and get into the free thing on his own terms. But harmonically, he's already, you know, throwing spice into a pastoral approach to his music. And he has the right people with him. Jim Hall on guitar, you know, again, lyrical, secure with himself, not having to play so many notes, but harmonically so interesting, very lyrical. Uh, some of these records with Hall are written off because there doesn't seem to be a lot of fire in Hall's playing because he's not all over the guitar, but he is expressing himself in ways that even Pat Metheny will say, or, you know, there it's, it's indisputable that he's one of the most important jazz guitarists. So the music is so durable because it's not about pyrotechnics. Uh, anytime virtuosity is taken to a, a certain degree, one has to decide how they're gonna balance velocity against lyricism. <laughs> In other words, you know, velocity is always good for drama. It's always good for, you know, for certain development of, of, of phrasing, but if you're in mid-tempo, this guy here with Red Mitchell on bass giving him so much incredible harmonic information. I mean, this was a record that should have happened earlier on, but unfortunately, Red Mitchell was not available. So the Jimmy Jeffrey three spawned with a different lineup, and then while they were in LA, Red Mitchell happened to be available for a week. Let's do it, let's go into the studio. They put this in the can and Verve put this record out. And it is, it is a precious record because it's three, you know, totally secure virtuosi who are playing music for music's sake and not trying to expand themselves beyond their soul. And uh, I, you know, the, these are records that I always go back to. Uh, I don't listen to them all the time but it makes you realize that if you, particularly if you're playing an instrument that 
And in, particularly if you're watching YouTube videos, which I am right now about, you know, learning the, my, the guitar, you know, these master classes and picking technique and velocity up, down. I mean, it's phenomenal what these guys can do, but one has to question at a certain point how much of it ends up being music. So this is music and it is music of a high order with lots of incredible harmonic information. Oh, perfect.